Um, first question is, uh, the talk was very uplifting, but what is the first step in establishing the community on a practical basis? The first step is to have that community in the heart. Because hearts which are not community minded, which are still focused on ethnicity, I'm a Pakistani, he's a Sudani, he's a Egyptian, hearts which have that cannot do it. We have to purify the heart from these sicknesses first. As Prophet Muhammad had said in a well known hadith found in Abu Dawood Al Muslim man salim al Muslimun min lisani hi wa yadi. The Muslim is one from whom other Muslims are safe from his hand, his tongue, and his hand. That's the true Muslim from whom other Muslims are safe from his tongue and his hand. He doesn't backbite them, he doesn't cheat them, take the properties of such. This is proper Muslim, the true Muslim. Well, Muhajir, the one who emigrates, man hajra ma nahallahu an, is one who leaves, who emigrates away from what Allah has prohibited. And in a hadith, found in Nishat, which are actually narrated by a Tirmidhi, which is authentic. Allah's Messenger said, I command you to do five things. To maintain the community, to maintain the community, to listen, to obey, to emigrate, and to fight in Allah's cause. He who secedes from the community as much as a span has cast off the tie of Islam from his neck. Unless he returns. And he who calls to what the pre Islamic people believe, the nationalistic call, belongs to the assemblies of Jahannam. He who calls to nationalism, tribalism belongs to the assemblies of Jahannam. Even if he fasts, prays, and asserts that he is a Muslim. So Islam has to be in the heart. The community has to be in the heart. The first step has to be from the heart. The first step is reaching out and finding our Muslim brothers from different backgrounds and coming together with them. Coming together with them. We can plan a project. We can begin with a school. Use that as the focal point. It could be a school, it could be other institutions. I'm just suggesting a school because the school is a pressing issue. A very pressing issue. Here people will build masjids up and down the country. But schools, you now everybody's thinking, you know, Prophet said, Man bana lillahi masjidan, then Allahu lahu baytan fil jannah. Whoever builds a masjid for the sake of Allah, Allah is going to build a house in paradise for you. He didn't say whoever builds a majjata, a school. No. So, you know, I want a house in paradise, okay? This is natural. But the reality is that the school and the majjata can be combined. Sorry, the school and the masjid can be combined. It can be multifunctional. We don't need huge buildings costing millions of pounds which only a few people line up there in the morning, five, six people get up there for Fajr. It only fills up on Eid. 
you know, or somebody dies who is well known in the community. We don't need structures like that. We need structures that can serve the needs of the community. So we have to think multi-purpose. So we can focus on a project. For example, those people who are involved in education in different parts of the country, try to get them together and focus on the development of schools, of a school. Choosing an area which has the potential for Hijra for the rest of the country. Not choosing an area to set up your school where you cannot develop. The school should be in an area which has the potential for development, further development. And bring those people who have the skills towards it. Encourage those who are going into school to get the training, the kind of training that they can come out and contribute to this effort. Because in many cases, we have situations where people are developing schools, Muslim schools around the country, but we don't have Muslim teachers. So they end up 60%, 70% of the teachers in the school are non-Muslim. I mean, of course, it's better than the public school, but still, the students will suffer. So ultimately, for that success, we must have both the school as well as the teachers, the staff, the administration, etc. So people need to be directed in that direction. Advertisements can be made inviting people who want to do this. Who want to do this, who feel this is important. They can connect. A number is given. Those who are interested, call this number, give me your name, leave your details on the, you know, in this office or in this place, or at the end of the conference, whatever, and we will start to get together to try to develop something. The first step can come in so many different ways, but it needs those people here who feel in their hearts, yes, what he said makes sense. It is from the Qur'an. It is from the Sunnah. He's not talking out of his heart. It makes sense. We need to do it. And we need to do it now. I don't want to be the one to say, I will start that effort. I'm starting it in the sense of conveying the concept to you. I don't live here. So practically speaking, I wouldn't want to start something that I'm not able to follow through. I don't want to, you know, break people's commitments or break commitments to people, etc. But if you want to do it, then we can circulate a paper right now where everybody who agrees that they want to do this, meaning when you say you want to do it, it means not that you want to sit around in, you know, in uh, armchair discussions and just talk, it's nice and yes, no, meaning I am ready to sacrifice to do this. To make sacrifices to do this. We can take a piece of paper right now and circulate it right through those who are here. And everybody who wants to do it, who is ready to make sacrifices, to work for this, can sign their name, put their telephone number. I think, I mean, there are other papers being circulated with questions. What I would suggest is if somebody has a notebook, they can send it around right now. And if we have three volunteers 
who are ready to follow this up. From the names that are written here, they are ready to take the responsibility of calling these people, coordinating another gathering which will focus on this issue and how to practically go ahead and do it. Then those three volunteers can make a note here on the paper or rather than that let me get one volunteer first who is ready stand up we have two three okay you can start with three and the three of you can you give your name call out your name please Salim Ahmed, somebody write that down. Hmm? Another name? Pardon? Aslam Muhammad Ahmed. Aslam Ahmed. As the other paper circulates, your number will be on it, and then at the end, you can take this and go ahead from there. Third name? Muhammad. Abi Wali. And we have somebody insisting standing number four, let him be there too. Akhtar Hussein. And since Allah is witr, so he should be witr, he is a unity, and he likes numbers which are odd, I need number five. Number five. Pardon? Hamid Mullah Ullah Ullah Oh Ullah Hamid Ullah Okay So we have five uh, I think we better stop here now brother Because <laughs> if we get six we gotta call for seven You know afterwards we can keep going We can keep going after that No, we had seven. Uh, we had five. Another one? Oh, uh, you have seven there already? Okay. So we can take this. Yes, there should be... Okay. <laughs> there should be amongst the sisters somebody doing the same. Since we had seven brothers, let there be seven sisters who give their names and somebody record it and they represent the sister committee of the same project. Barakallahu <laughs> feekum. May Allah bless all of you and make this the beginning of something new. من سن سنة حسنة الصفحة تعالى من الصامت whoever begins a good سنة he gets the reward of everyone who follows that سنة without decreasing their reward in the least. So I pray inshallah this is the beginning of a new سنة. In this country we have to pay mortgages. How do we avoid this? for establishing a new community. As I said, the issues concerning the economics, etc. should be tackled simultaneously. We shouldn't think in terms that we'll not establish economic institutions until after we establish the community. No. Some people can be working on the school aspect. Some people can be working on the economic aspect. You know, setting up economic institutions which will help Muslims get out of the situation of riba. Because, of course, I don't have to stress to you how serious the sin of riba is. A sin so serious that Prophet Muhammad has said that it has over 70 branches, the simplest of which is like a man having sex with his mother. 
I mean, you can't get any more serious than that. But Allah and His Messenger have declared war on those who refuse to give it up. Are we ready to fight Allah and His Messenger? So practically speaking, there, need, there is a need for those people who have the economic background, the skills and the knowledge in economics to work towards the development of economic institutions which will help to alleviate these problems. But in the meantime, in the meantime, beware. Beware, because riba is corrupting. It destroys. يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ الرِّبَا وَيُرْبِ الصَّدَقَةِ Allah has cursed riba. And He has blessed with growth charity. Let us beware. Beware that we don't justify riba when there really is no justification. Let us remember that every pound that we pay in rent, though we end up at the end of the year with nothing, is worth so much more. It's added to our scale of good deeds in comparison to the pound that we pay in mortgage, which is cursed, which is added to our scale of evil deeds on the day when we don't want to see evil deeds on our scale. How can we overcome the criticism and opposition by the majority in this country by creating ghettos and being segregated whilst also trying to establish our own schools and other Muslim institutions? Well, the accusation of ghettoization, this is only valid in ethnic communities. Where all the Pakistanis gather in one town or another town, then it becomes a ghetto. You know, you can find the road and say, hey, it's all Pakistanis, but they're drug dealers, Pakistani drug dealers, Pakistani, you know, selling alcohol and all these other things. So, it's just an area which becomes a rundown area, property values drop and all these other things. Because it is based on ethnic background, culture, culture. Whereas, a community of believers is an open community. It's open in the sense that it doesn't close itself off to the rest of the society. It invites them in. It invites them in for da'wah. Its existence is da'wah. It will prove to this country what Islam can do for them. It represents the actions which speak louder than the many words. So, it would not be a ghetto. Ghetto where there is corruption, etc., etc., no. It would be a sanctuary. That's what it would be. It would be a sanctuary where so many people in this country would be begging us, non-Muslims, would be begging us to allow them to come in with us. Believe me. Because they're suffering too. They're suffering. They can see the crime, they can see the drugs, they can see what's happening in their schools, the television, and all these different things. They can see it. Some of them are crying out different, you know, at different points to hear them. They are suffering. It wouldn't be a ghetto, brothers and sisters. It would be a sanctuary. Where we didn't even have to hold the people out. We don't have any more room yet, you know. 
That is the reality. Please could you explain the situation regarding accepting a wage for teaching the Quran and Quranic Arabic? Could you mention the evidence to support taking or not taking money for this kind of teaching? Okay, the evidence for, teaching, uh, for taking wages for teaching Islam and Quran is based on uh, Mus'ab ibn Umair who went to Medina who was sent by the Prophet to Medina and whose basic needs were taken care of while he taught. That the person who is taking from their time to teach has needs and the money they're giving is not for the teaching but to help them fulfill their needs. This is the basis. In school, you want a teacher to come into school to teach Islamic studies and to teach Arabic, Quran, Tajweed, etc. That teacher has to live. They have to be able to function. So you give them money to help them to function while they're teaching. You're not paying them for teaching. You're not paying them for teaching. You're you're giving them money to enable them to teach. It may seem like a subtle difference, but this is how it has to be looked at. And this is where it is justified. Where a person has the need, they don't have a need, then of course they should teach from themselves without taking any remuneration. Of course this is higher, this is greater, if one has the need. Um, I'm going to sort of paraphrase, there's a lot of similar questions from the sisters regarding permissibility and general issues regarding whether they can leave home to study at a university in this country or not. Hey, this is an issue which is, you know, a controversial type issue, which becomes a problem because of the fact that there is no community. When you don't have the community, then you see all these sicknesses, all these problems arise. Whether it is husbands beating their wives, you know, problems in the home, all the different types of family problems that arise or it is issues regarding education, or it is riba or so on. All of these problems are a product of the lack of community. Because in your community, when you establish school, you don't stop at secondary school. Once you finish establishing that, then you start to establish a college, a university. He works towards that. Of course, it takes time. And what do you do in the meantime? In the meantime, because it is necessary to have educated people it is necessary to have educated people to establish those institutions whether it be the educational institutions or the medical or financial or whatever institutions, the knowledge right now is in universities of the disbelievers. So it means that the only way to get that knowledge at this point in time, for those of us that are here, is that we are going to have to go in to some haram circumstances in the universities, sitting in mixed classes, you know, and what exists in the university, we will have to make that sacrifice to get that knowledge so that the next generation will not have to do what we have to do. But if nobody goes there, then the next generation will be in the same situation that we are in. And they will curse us they will curse us 
because we had the chance to change it, and we didn't. So where there is no school available, no university available for those sisters who are going into necessary courses, again, we're not talking about going to learn cooking, sociology, you know, these types of uh, courses which are either, you know, entertaining type courses or courses that provide false knowledge, knowledge which is against the Quran and Sunnah. If they're in trying to gain certain knowledge of critical courses with the goal of bringing it back to the community, to the development of the community, then, inshallah, Allah will forgive them for making that step. And we're not saying the ends justify the means. We're saying the lesser of two evils. We have an evil which is that right now I send my wife to the dentist. And that dentist, if you, any of you have recently been to the dentist and think back what your position was in relationship to the dentist. Here you are stretched out on this chair. And the dentist has his nose such a nose. And you sent your wife to that dentist. Think about it. Is that an evil or is it not an evil? That is an evil. Without providing a female dentist, then we are obliging our community to send their women into that state of evil. So, for a sister to go and study dentistry, to alleviate her other sisters from that greatest state of evil is, in my view and in the view of a number of other scholars, permissible. This is preventing a greater evil. I know there are a number of scholars at the same time who say women, they only need to learn to read and write, that's it. Send them to primary school, once they finish learning how to read and write, stay at home, finish. This is the view of some scholars, multiple scholars. That is their view. And if you feel that that is what is appropriate for your family, you don't mind sending your wife to the uh, dentist, then, mashallah, that is your choice. But there are others who view that in this circumstance, given these circumstances here, it is legitimate for women to go out and get this knowledge, but it has to be with this intention. It has to be with the intention of serving the Muslim community. Removing from them a greater harm. And secondly, the sister who is going has to be somebody whose dream is solid. She knows the dean. She is not a sister who is still struggling. Should I cover my head or shouldn't I cover my head? No, no, no. You won't send a sister in that state of mind into that circumstance. That is suicide. That is religious suicide. It has to be a sister who is clear. She is maintaining complete, proper hijab. She is established her prayer. She is not shaky. Such a sister, you can stay under those circumstances here. Alhamdulillah, <clears throat> this started off the same question three times, so I can go to read it. If a family came to this country on the basis of wealth and still have the passport of the Muslim country, should they go immediately back? Again, please. If a family came to this country on the basis of wealth, but still have the passport to a Muslim country, should they go immediately back, i.e. sell up? I.e. sell up. Sell up. Oh, 
Shema. Okay. Um, a person who came here, obviously, he came for the wrong intention, just seeking, as you said, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, uh, who now realizes that was the wrong intention, they have a choice here now. If they see themselves contributing to the effort of establishing Islam and community here, then they may stay and continue with the struggle. But if they see they have nothing to contribute, they're on the door, or virtually on the door, and they're just living, it's better for them to go back. They still have the means, they can buy tickets and get back out of here, then it's better. As they say, you are the part of the solution, or you're part of the problem. Um, a lot of similar questions about what you do if you want to send your children to Muslim schools, but they are basically too costly, too expensive. Well, again, as I said, this is, this is part of the, the, the need where schools are not community-based in the sense that they are supported by a full community that can now reduce the fees to a point where it is accessible to the mass of people. You know, where it's only a few people involved in it. Then, we find ourselves in such kinds of situations. Such a person who has no choice. They don't have the means, the economic means to do it. Then, of course, you know, Allah is merciful if they have the intention in their heart to do it as soon as the opportunity arises. And they should be working with those who are trying to do it. But, I must say that before I would accept that a person is not able to afford it, we have to look into that person's life. You know, I would say, list your expenses. You know, if there is in your budget a chunk of money which is spent on junk, you know, whether it's junk food, or whether it is, you know, junk in the terms of, of trivialities, things you just stick around your home to, adore, you know, uh, things you like to stick on the wall or stick on desks or, you know, there, there's a bunch of, of junk that we tend to put in our homes, which we don't need. Right? There are monies which are being spent daily, weekly, which we really don't need to spend. You know, if a person says that in my budget there is nothing like that, then I would say, MashaAllah, this is, you know, Allah's test for you and He's most merciful because He determines your risk. And be patient, struggle, try to find a way, and inshallah Allah will help you. But if in your life you know, you know, you've got a sweet tooth, Every day you have to feed it. So many Kit Kat bars and Twixes and, you know, and you just, you see, you don't realize it, you know, like the person who smokes when you add up how much he spends on smoking in a year, it, you know, it's a huge amount, but when you think of it on a daily basis, it doesn't seem like much. But, you know, if you person, you have people who have these sweet foods that they've got to feed constantly. When you add up at the end of a week or end of a month how much they actually spend on candy, you might find half of the fees for paying for the kids to go to school. You might. So I'm just saying, for a person to, to say I just don't have the means, one has to seriously look at one's budget. Check oneself thoroughly. Am I wasting money on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, etc., etc.? Is there any room, any way that I can extract some money here or there to find those keys to get my child to the school? Or in another town, there is a cheaper school. But, you know, I want to be here because my friends are here and my visitors are there and, you know, so it becomes a, an emotional thing. There is another school, but I don't want to go there. I don't like Birmingham or I don't like this town, you know. I'm from the this place and the that place. Again, I said, what is this? You just said you couldn't, but no, you can. So again, we have to look at the situation very honestly and we have to remove our personal, emotional likes and dislikes which may hamper us from providing that education for our children.
Mm. But before you do that, okay, as a note regarding school projects, Brixton, uh, Brixton Masjid has started a boys' school last year, 1996. The number of kids are students, but only one teacher. It is based in the masjid, poor facilities, the school has had to be closed due to a lack of male teachers. They need at least three to four brothers trained as teachers, inshallah, to get the school off the ground. They realize that they need to pay a reasonable salary as well. MashaAllah, the girls' school is running. This is an opportunity straight away to aim for. But the Brixton are aiming to get the school running again properly, inshallah. In a couple of years' time, they desperately need brothers. This is one example, and I'm sure there are many others. You know, there are school projects which are in need, and I've heard it, different places I've been to, in need of teaching. Many sisters tend to go into teaching, and the brothers tend to go into other areas. There needs to be more males going into education, because on the primary level, we can get away with female teachers teaching our children you know, up to about the age of 10. Once they get into 10, then we should have, they should have male teachers. You know, so most of the schools are starting, the new ones are starting on the primary level, uh, so we're covered to some degree that we need to have people now, males, brothers, going into uh, education, fields of, different fields of education, to provide, you know, secondary education for our males. And there's a general tendency throughout the country, <coughs> amongst the communities, to set up a girls' school. You know, they have money, they're going to set up a school at the girls' school. And everywhere they get more money to set up another girls' school, and another girls' school. You know, we want to protect the girls. But you see, it's like a double standard thing, you know. The girls, we try to keep them pure, because if they get out there and they, mix, and they mess up, well, they have a kid, it shows. Whereas the boys, you know, if they mess up, they can always come back, nobody knows, they can go here, go there. But this is the wrong philosophy. It's a dangerous philosophy. We are raising our girls pure, and then we're going to turn them over to corrupt guys. And that's why right. so many problems, the sisters are mentioning, I married this guy, he was supposed to be a this, and I found out he's drinking, he's doing this, he wants to do that, he doesn't want to study, he doesn't want to learn Islam, and doesn't pray, and... So many cases like this. Because the boys have been neglected. No, this is a, a wrong philosophy. You know, the pure are for the pure. Let us try to protect both our males as well as our females. Um, I've got a lot of very similar notes informing me, or wanting to inform you, that there is, in fact, the availability of halal mortgages, so-called, through the United Bank of Kuwait. And then there's an equal number of papers asking um, the Sheikh, can you explain if this halal mortgage is actually halal or not? So, <laughs> Sounds like they're asking about halal interest, right? Halal riba. <laughs> well, uh, leading scholars from all parts of the Muslim world have gathered and analyzed the, the process of purchase and resale at a higher cost and concluded that this according to Islamic law is permissible. If the bank buys a property and sells it back to you at a higher price that this represents two sales and not one sale with two within it. It represents two separate sales. And this is one of the bases under which most of the Islamic banks function. But rather than give you a loan, Qarb Hasana, they don't want to hear that one. You know? And the true Islamic bank 
would have this facility. Those who are planning or thinking to work towards it, they should keep that in mind. Because this is an integral part. The Qard Hasana, the good be loan. The loan for the sake of Allah, where the loan is given. But the principle where the bank buys your house that you want to buy, it pays for it, it becomes the property of the bank, and then you purchase the house from the bank at a higher price, which you will pay over in installments, for example. But this principle, according to the majority of scholars who have analyzed this, and they put it out in the form of a fatwa coming from uh, the Rabbata, they meet yearly, there's a thick council there, which meets yearly, analyzes, brings the evidences back and forth, and this is what they ruled, that it is permissible. I know many of you may say, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between that and riba? Allah said in the Quran 1,400 years ago that people asked the same question. Inna mal bay'u mithlu riba. Buying and selling is like riba. Wa ahalla Allahu al bay'a wa harrama al riba. That Allah has made sale permissible and forbidden interest. So, the fact that there is similarity doesn't necessarily mean that it is the same. There is a similarity between pork and beef. There is a similarity, but they are not the same. There is a similarity between alcohol, between wine and grape juice, but they are not the same. For everything which is haram, there is something halal similar. To be read, Aina? No, it isn't. Aina is where, so I can remember exactly how it goes now, the tricky thing. You want to borrow some money. You want to borrow a hundred pounds. So, I will sell you this pen for 200 pounds, which you will pay over a period of time. That is Aina. It's a riba, it's hidden riba. We agree that you will buy this pen, and we put it down in a document, for 200 pounds, which you will give me 